Okay, so in this final lecture in our three-part series on ventilation and perfusion, we're going to look at ventilation and perfusion in, in various disease states. <clears throat> Before this, I just want to cover some basic principles which we would have talked about in the past, but just to reiterate this before we really start talking. So, we're looking at oxygen and carbon dioxide. So let's start with CO2 actually. CO2 is a highly soluble gas and it's transported dissolved in the serum. It is it moves across the um, capillary alveolar membrane by diffusion and once there is a gradient the CO2 will move. So once the CO2 in the blood is higher than the CO2 in the alveolus then we will have excretion of CO2 through the lungs. The main factor affecting this is ventilation. But actually we're talking about global ventilatory capacity of the lung. It depends on the minute volume of the entire lung. And that's because, because CO2 is so soluble, if we have a part of the lung that is not very well ventilated and so not really taking part in CO2 excretion, that can be made up for by other parts of the lung that are taking part in um, ventilation. So the biggest thing that affects CO2 retention is hypoventilation at a global level, not at a regional level within the lung. So it depends on your minute volume. Okay, let's think about oxygen. So oxygen moves from the alveolus to the capillary but it is not very soluble and it needs to bind to hemoglobin to be transported in the blood and that system can be and is saturated <clears throat> therefore um, oxygen transport depends on matching the oxygen delivery to the alveolus with the blood flow across the pulmonary capillary such that just the right amount of oxygen reaches to saturate the hemoglobin before it moves on. Two points here. One is any mismatch between oxygen delivery and capillary blood flow will lead to hypoxia and this can be on either side either we have insufficient ventilation or insufficient oxygen in the air or we have insufficient blood flow and either of these will reduce the amount of oxygen uptake in the blood and ultimately the oxygen saturation in the blood secondly regional deficiencies in either ventilation or perfusion will also lead to hypoxia. Because the system is so easily saturated, a reduction in oxygen transfer in one part of the lung cannot be easily made up by the other parts of the lung, which are already functioning at almost full capacity. So that's one principle to remember. The other, which we'll talk about when we're talking about diseases, is that because of this, the lung moves to compensate. So if we have an area of lung that is underventilated and or alveoli that are hypoxic, there is low oxygen tension in the alveolus, the vessels supplying that area tend to constrict so that Poor ventilation tends to cause a reflex reduction in perfusion and in that way we maintain ventilation perfusion mismatch. So the parts of the lung that are not working ventilation wise will also not be perfused. Conversely parts of the lung that are hypoperfused so parts of the lung not getting enough blood supply tend not to be ventilated as well because the bronchioles go into spasm. This is a protective mechanism for the lung 
to, men, to make sure that ventilation and perfusion at a regional level are maintained. Okay, with these principles in mind, let's think about two um, scenarios. One in which on the right hand side there is collapsed lung, so decreased ventilation, but normal perfusion. So let's just draw a little lung segment here. The easiest thing to think about is an area of atelectasis. And on the other side, we're going to think about along with normal ventilation but decreased perfusion. And let's think about a wedge in fact. It's an area of unperfused lung. The area of decreased ventilation with normal perfusion is called an area of shunt. So the blood is shunted directly from the left side of the circulation, from the right side of the circulation into the left side without being oxygenated. And on the left side, the area that is underperfused but normally ventilated is an area of dead space. We have lung that is being ventilated, but since no blood is flowing through it, there is no perfusion, there is no oxygen uptake. So on the left side, what happens is that with the lack of ventilation, that blood is not being oxygenated. That deoxygenated blood then mixes with normally oxygenated blood and drops the overall PO2 of the blood entering into the left ventricle, which should be highly oxygenated. So, um, shunt, let me just write those words in here. So this one is shunt. And this one is dead space. So this area of shunt will cause hypoxia. However, as we said, the CO2 is much more soluble and therefore although that bit of blood is not being relieved of its CO2, by increasing our minute ventilation and increasing blood flow to other areas of the lung, the CO2 exchange can be increased to compensate for that. And therefore, when the blood mixes, the CO2 level will be normal or with patients who are hyperventilating can even be low. So with shunt, you have hypoxia with normal or low CO2 levels. Let's look at dead space. With dead space, the ventilation is occurring but there is no perfusion. Once a big enough segment is affected, we are going to be unable to oxygenate enough blood to make up for this and the patient becomes hypoxic. If we look at the CO2, however, as before, even though that bit of lung is being ventilated but not perfused, the rest of the lung is perfused. And therefore, by increasing blood flow through the other alveoli and by increasing ventilatory rate, we can make up for the loss of CO2 excretion that is being experienced by that diseased lung. So again, with regional areas of dead space, we end up with hypoxia and a normal or low CO2. So mismatch of ventilation and perfusion in general 
causes um, type 1 respiratory failure, hypoxia with a normal or low PCO2. What are some of the factors which lead to ventilation and perfusion mismatch? Well, these would include asthma, COPD, interstitial lung disease, ARDS, um, bronchopneumonia, and as you can imagine, although to, for the description, we just showed one area of dead space and one area of shunt, in some of these conditions, such as ARDS, you can have multiple areas of dead space and shunt existing together. And the overall effect would be hypoxia with normal or low CO2. Let's think about what happens when somebody has had one of these conditions for a while and then we either ventilate them or we correct the perfusion abnormality. So remember, during the course of the disease, the underperfused areas will also become underventilated because of bronchospasm, and the underventilated areas will also become underperfused because of vasoconstriction, thus maintaining ventilation perfusion mismatch. When we correct the primary abnormality, so we increase blood flow to the underperfused area, or we increase ventilation, so just put an asthmatic on a ventilator, the first thing that happens is that we now have an area of lung that is, for example, in the asthmatic, is ventilated but still underperfused because of the reflex vasoconstriction which hasn't solved itself yet. Or in the situation where we improve blood flow but there's still bronchospasm, you're going to get good perfusion but under ventilation, at least until the reflex corrects itself. That is why Sometimes in the resuscitation of patients with ventilation perfusion mismatch, correcting ventilation or correcting perfusion abnormalities can initially lead to worsening hypoxia. However, as the body corrects itself, this also corrects itself. So that was a very brief look at the physiology behind ventilation perfusion mismatch. I think this is just a starting point. You will need to read more about this topic and see if you can apply these principles to other conditions in which there is ventilation and perfusion mismatch. I hope you found these three little talks helpful. We can discuss them further in class. Thank you.